I think it's worth saying something about other forms of feudal service. Um, because it's not just a matter of uh, 40 days service in the Royal Army. Curiously, there's actually more evidence, probably, about what's called castle guard, the obligation on knights uh, to provide castle garrisons than there is for, the, uh, for these field armies. Um, and we know of very elaborate rotor systems, for example, that were set up for knights at uh, Dover is one good example, uh, Richmond in Yorkshire is another. Um, at Dover, it, worked, it was worked roughly on a, on a month or a 30-day principle um, with rotors of knights serving. At Richmond, uh, it was um, organised in such a way that the garrison was twice as large in summer as in winter, because summer, of course, is the campaigning season. And it looks as if this is a realistic system intended to provide actual garrisons. Um, and even as late as the 15th century, there's a, a drawing of Richmond Castle um, showing the towers of the castle with the banners of the various constabularies um, flying from each tower, showing which section of the castle each constabulary of knights was responsible for in providing this service. It's a little odd to think that people really turned out um, and spent su substantial amounts of time uh, sitting around, rather bored and probably quite drunk, uh, in a castle uh, for you know, a month, uh, maybe in some cases more, that uh, at Norwich the uh, Abbot of Berry was supposed to provide uh, four groups of ten knights, each serving for three months uh, to serve castle guard. Um, and uh, a very odd feature about this, too, is that actually not every castle uh, had systems of castle guard. The greatest castle of all, uh, the Tower of London, did not. Uh, Colchester, another great massive stone castle of the Conquest period, no castle guard recorded there. It is very odd. It is perfectly plain that um, this is a form of service that was clearly um, turned into a monetary payment, a rent, uh, from an early date. It's hard to imagine that um, somebody would serve, uh, would go from Oxfordshire, um, go all the way to Dover to perform his military service and then go back again. Of course he would prefer uh, to pay a money rent. Um, you didn't actually need to have a large garrison in a castle all the time anyway. You wouldn't want these people hanging around, um, as I say, getting drunk and carousing. You wanted you know, a small um, professional group of men who would maintain the structure and look after it properly. At a time of need, you would want to hire knights as a garrison. But there was this system of castle guard in, in existence. Um, it was remembered. It did go on right through. And I ought just to say, too, that um, though I was talking largely in terms of feudal service up to the period of Magna Carta, that the other form of, the, the, the main form of feudal service, of the armies, that did continue, albeit in a very reduced form, uh, with the final effective summons being issued um, in 1327. Um, so it, it did go on, people did go on producing service as late as that. Um, it is something that, that is realistic, and you can't go with the argument that the whole thing was simply financial from the outset. That doesn't work any more than it doesn't work to say this is how armies were actually formed, and this is the real basis of medieval armies. Um, it's an element, but no more than an element. One thing I'm conscious of in talking about this is that um, there's really no human interest, is there, in what I've been saying. Um, and um, I'm afraid that many sorts of medieval history are matters of uh, looking at uh, charters, at uh, account books, uh, adding up the sums, um, and the, the, the human side doesn't really come out that strongly. Um, you do find some nice things occasionally um, in, in this that make you sit up slightly. There's the nice case of the um, tenant of the Earl of Gloucester um, called Elias Testiculis Aureis. Um, Elias Golden Balls, but I think you'd be a bit stuck uh, to trace uh, David Beckham's descent uh, from that particular tenant to the Earl of Gloucester. Nice if someone could do it. Um, where you really find the, 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 the nice bits are actually in the, in the oddities of a slightly different form of feudal service, that below knight service you could have sergeanty service. 
Um, that's not knights, but it's the next rank down, as it were. Um, and the really nice examples, I'm afraid, are not military, but there are some military ones. There's the chap who, who owed service, was obliged to turn up mounted uh, with um, a bow and arrow. And he was obliged uh, to use this, but he only went with one arrow. So the first time he saw any enemy, he shot off his arrow, and then that was his service done, and he could go off back home again. Um, there are these occasional characters of that sort, but it's more the, the, the service of the chap who holds a manor in return for packing up the king's chess set when he's finished playing, um, and uh, rearing royal puppies, uh, looking after the royal hawks. Um, the famous one, of course, is the um, tenant of the manor of Hemmingston in Stuffolk. Um, the tenant was to appear at the king's court every Christmas day um, and leap, whistle and fart for the king's amusement. Um, but I'm sorry, that's not, unfortunately, a, a, a military tenure. Finally, how important is all this? Um, first question, I suppose, um, did feudal military service provide the Normans with some kind of advantage over the Anglo-Saxons? Um, is this one of the keys to Norman success in the 11th century? I think actually that's quite hard to argue. Um, the key is the military technology that the Normans had, uh, the knight, um, on his horse with a good, with a, a good coat of mail, um, experienced in the use of his lance, his sword with a, with a splendid helmet and a nasal on. Um, and um, I mean, the Norman knight is clearly a pretty invincible weapon in the 11th century, but tie that into how he actually holds his land and his obligation in the 40 days, that doesn't really work. These knights could be hired. They're just as effective in warfare, however you recruit them. So it's the military technology there. And, of course, also very important is the military, te is the military technology of the castle. That's vital um, in establishing Norman control. But that's, again, got nothing to do with systems of military service. How important is this feudal system in providing kings with armies? Well, it provides a significant element. It provides really quite useful numbers on occasion. Um, I suppose at a vital point, I've referred already to that rebellion of 1173-4, when you couldn't really rely on the nobles, on your tenants, um, and so you turned to mercenary troops, and they were the key crap, crack troops of the 12th century. The feudal element is one part of a, a complex uh, military system, and it's no more than that. And it does. It, it, it is. I wouldn't stress its importance in those terms. In financial terms, um, then I think it is quite significant. Um, scutage is important at a time when there are few other forms of taxation, when the old Anglo-Saxon geld is becoming is yielding less and less money. Um, it's a very antiquated system with all sorts of increasing problems, exemptions and so forth. And scutage is useful. The problem with it is, of course, that you could only levy it when you'd actually got a campaign. Um, John started changing that and started levying it every, virtually every year, whether there's a campaign or not. Um, and that is something, of course, that was raised in Magna Carta and was strongly objected to, and taxation becomes fully subject uh, to proper, proper consent and eventually parliamentary consent. Um, and finally, um, I think this military feudalism is, of course, part of a, a landholding structure, a complicated landholding structure involving hereditary right, involving a whole legal system. That's, that's a whole different ballgame, as it were. Um, and the introduction of feudal land law is something very, very important. Um, but that's, that's a different topic. Um, it's not really... Uh, feudal military service is a part of that, but it's a very small part of, of that quite different story.